Um, so first thing to do is to welcome uh, Sue and say thank you very much, uh, Sue, for, for joining us um, today to very helpfully, I think, explain how we should live uh, drawing on ancient tragedy. So <laughs> hopefully there will be some uplifting aspects to that and some as well as some some useful ones but I, I thought it was a great topic we've been we've been um hearing about various sources of moral moral and ethical um inspiration in nature uh, and so also jesus we covered briefly uh, last time um and uh, ancient philosophy i think is a very very natural progression uh, back in time uh, so we will uh, ask you to talk for yeah just about um, 35 minutes till 10 past eight and then we'll have discussion so do feel free I think last time it worked quite well to post uh, written questions in the chat or if you can uh, manage it you can also raise your hand using um, the uh, reaction button at the bottom I think and we'll find you that way but I think that the best way was writing it in the chat um, and at the end so just before 20 to 9 I will talk a little bit about our, our next talk. Uh, Sue thanks again uh, I see you are already off mute fantastic mm -hmm. uh, so over to you thank you. Okay thank you very much um, well thank you for the invitation and I'm only sorry that we can't all be in ponds in the pub with a few drinks and uh, sort of huddled together as we used to be. But, but there it is. And it's um, uplifting to, to hear cheering, to hear that it may be possible for you to meet, for some of us to meet in, in the summer. So let's hope that, that there's light at the end of the tunnel and it isn't an oncoming train. Um, so thank you again. Now, when I was asked, first asked to, to, to give a talk in this series. It was probably, it feels like a million years ago. Um, and my understanding then was that the whole series for the year was to be on the topic of what counts as philosophy. And so I, I started there and time passed and pandemics came and life became more and more difficult. But I, I stuck with the thing I, I thought of in the first place. And, and that was this topic, how should one live? And I, I took that question because the overall theme was to be, or perhaps is, what counts as, as philosophy? And I took that question to be a question about the subject matter of philosophy. What is it that philosophers do? You know, if you, in those days when you could get on a train, people would set, say, people sitting opposite, you would say, well, what do you do? And I confess, I usually used to say I teach English because it was easy. But if you say, well, I teach philosophy, then you get a lot of stuff about, well, what's your philosophy then and what do philosophers do and so on. And, and it's, you know, it's a perfectly legitimate question. What is it that philosophers do? So I took the question, what's the content of philosophy to be? What is it that philosophers do? What, what's the subject matter of philosophy? What questions do philosophers ask? And, and we all know, don't we, that um, philosophy is a series of footnotes uh, to, to Plato. So I thought I'd start there and I'm going to try now with the technology, share my screen and you get the pictures and not just my voice. Let's see what we can do. Oh, host disable participant screen sharing. Ah, I will need to make you a host, which can I'm sure, I can, yep. sure I can work that out. Can you do it? Uh, let's see. Yes, you should now be able okay, to share now, your oh, screen. As yeah. you are the host now. So let me try. That's working now. Where is, where is my, here we go. Um, bear with me. There we go. So this is um, the overall questions, what's the content of, of philosophy? 
what is it the philosophers do, what questions do philosophers answer? And I thought, and it's a bit mischievous, really. I, I have this this opening slide, um, which is which is the uh, the Raphael um, painting with Plato with his finger in the air. And I have that because I know that, and you've had it in the background there already. I know that that uh, uh, that's your logo, so to speak, is Plato with his finger in the air in cartoon form. But but here he is, in there he is behind Nick. In, in as, as understood by Raphael. So I thought, well, I'm going to start with Plato. If we want to know what is it that philosophers do, what's, what's the subject matter of philosophy? Well, Plato says um, the, the, the subject matter of philosophy is, is, is how one should live. Now I need to, uh oh, let me just try to get, yeah, that's it. And he says, that's a statue from outside in, from Athens, statue of Plato. And Plato says in book one of, of the Republic, um, it's not a trivial question that, that we're asking. It's not a, uh, philosophy is not asking a trivial question. What we're talking about is how one should live. And he takes that to be the central question of philosophy. It's, it's the question that comes up in book, book one of the Republic. And it's the question that informs all Plato's writings subsequently. How should one live? Um, and what I want to do now is to, as it were, endorse Plato's thought that that's the central question of, of philosophy, not the only question, but a central question. And I want to say that in answering that question, we here and now in the 21st century can make use of and should make use of the resources of the ancient, the writings of the ancient tradition tragedians. So the central question is how should one live? And the answer is an answer which we will be facilitate, which will which will which we will be helped to understand if we look at the, the tragedians. So so that's the question, how should one live? And that's the answer. Well read read the, the ancient tragedians and you'll find out. But you can't you can't get to the answer as quickly as that. So I want to put in now some, some dissenting views and, and there are important reasons for this. So here's a man called, you, you may not have heard of him. Um, I confess I, I hadn't. Um, and he's called T.D. Weldon. He was an Oxford Don who died in 1958. And his most, he was very, very influential in, in his day. And his most famous book was a book of 1953 called The Vocabulary of Politics. And here's, look, here's Weldon's answer. The purpose of philosophy is to expose and elucidate linguistic muddles. It has done its job when it has revealed the confusions which have occurred and are likely to recur in inquiries into matters of fact, because the structure and the use of language are what they are. So for Weldon, in, 19, in the 1950s, and indeed for a very large part of the early part of the 20th century, the answer to the question, what does philosophy do, or what counts as philosophy is, well, the job of philosophy is, is to elucidate linguistic models. Uh, the great, late great uh, philosopher Sydney, New York philosopher Sydney Morgan Besser um, said, well, what do, you, what do philosophers do? Well, uh, you make a few. You make a few distinctions. You clarify a few concepts. It's a living, and this is Weldon's thought too. The job of philosophy is to elucidate linguistic model, and that thought in Weldon that the job of the philosopher is a linguistic job, is known is is, is most famous, I suppose, in the writings of in this country of A. J. Ayer, in particularly in his book. Language, Truth and Logic of 1936. And here's Ayer. It's important to be clear how strong his claim is. Ayer says, if I say stealing money is wrong, I produce a sentence that has no factual meaning. That is, expresses no proposition that can be either true or false. I am merely expressing certain moral sentiments. So that's air in 1936, and it's largely repeated by Weldon in 1953. And it runs as a thread 
I won't say a golden thread, I think it's a ghastly thread, but runs as a thread through the philosophy of the early 20th century. And the thinking just is, what philosophers do is to clarify conceptual and ling linguistic error or confusion. And in the clarification, this is Ayer's thought, in the clarification, what you will see is that sentences, moral, moral comments, moral remarks like stealing money is wrong are straightforwardly meaningless because they cannot be shown to be either true or false. There's no empirical investigation that shows you that that sentence, stealing money is wrong, is either true or false. It is, it is in fact, as says Ayer, meaningless. And that's why he takes moral statements, moral sentences like stealing money is wrong to, to be, he, he calls them expressions of moral sentiments. They are just like boo and hurrah. When I say stealing money is wrong, I just say boo for stealing money. And if I say um, giving to charity is good, I say hurrah for giving, for, for giving money to charity. So it was this sort of thinking, the Weldon thinking, the air thinking, the logical positivists in the early part of the 20th century who led to what was quite straightforwardly and, and literally the demise of moral and political philosophy in such that in 1956, uh, Peter Laslett was able to, to say, for the moment anyway, political philosophy is dead. Political philosophy and moral philosophy were largely dead. And they were dead because it was thought that sentences like stealing money is wrong have no meaning whatsoever. They can't be shown to be true or false. Now that I think sounds quite ludicrous to us now, but, but I would say this, uh, it was hugely influential. And when I was a graduate student in Oxford in 1973, there was no moral philosophy paper on the graduate BPhil course. You could do a bit of moral philosophy with other things, but there was no moral philosophy paper as such. And I think I'm right in saying that there was no political philosophy at all. And that was because of the influence, the overwhelming influence of this linguistic understanding of philosophy. And I, I'm very happy to, to answer questions about that. In, in discussion if people would be interested, because I think it, there's a huge, huge change in our understanding of philosophy from you know, even my own day, as it were, even from the 1970s, our understanding has been absolutely altered dramatically. But all I want to do now is to say, well, here's the question, what's the subject matter of philosophy? Here's Plato's answer, philosophy tells us how we should live, here's, Ayer's answer, Weldon's answer, philosophy tells us um, what, what the moral words mean. What is the meaning of stealing money is wrong? What's the meaning of words like should and ought and right? And what I want to do now is just take a, another answer to the central question, what does philosophy do? What's the subject matter of philosophy before going back to Plato's answer? So moving on, in John Stuart Mill and in Immanuel Kant in the 18th, 19th century, the central question of philosophy, of moral philosophy, is taken to be, what ought I to do? So it's not how should one live, it's not what does the moral language means, mean, it's what ought I to do? And famously, or notoriously, Immanuel Kant answers the question in this way, what you ought to do is to act only on the maxim which you can at the same time will to become a universal law. And John Stuart Mill, the utilitarian, says you should do those things which tend to promote the greatest amount of happiness and the least amount of pain. So for Kant, the question what ought I to do is answered by reference to rules or principles, moral rules, moral principles, for Mill, it's answered by reference to the, the consequences of, of one's action. You should do the action which will promote greatest happiness and least pain. I don't hear, excuse me, I just have some water. I don't hear want to adjudicate between 
the Kantians and the utilitarians, though I'm happy to do so in other contexts. The point of raising this here is just to say, here's a third answer to the question, what's, what, what, do moral, what do philosophers do? What's the content of philosophy? What counts as philosophy? Philosophy answers questions, guides us in answering the question, what ought I to do? So what do philosophers do? For Plato, they tell us how one should live. For Kant and John Stuart Mill, they say they guide us in what we ought to do. For Weldon and Ayer and the logical positivists, they tell us what the language means, what the words, what the moral words mean. So let me go back now to Plato's question. It's not a trivial question. What we're talking about is how one should live. This is Plato's, Plato's view. That's how we should live. And I just want to draw attention now to how this question, Plato's question, differs from the question that's asked by Kant or by Mill or by the linguistic philosophers. Um, and it obviously isn't a question about, about language, so Plato's question is very different. But it's also not a question um, that's asked in the same way by, the, by, by Kant or by John Stuart Mill. It's not what should we do. So Plato isn't envisaging us being in a position of, at, at a particular moment in a moral dilemma or with a moral question, as it were, staring us in the face. And the question then is, well, what do we do now? Quest, Plato's question is, how should one live? And the distinction between his question and Plato's and Mill's question or Kant's question is explained in this way by Bernard Williams. Williams writes, there is a peculiar emphasis given to Socrates' question in that it stands at a distance from any actual and particular occasion of considering what to do. It's a general question about what to do because it asks how to live. And it is also in a sense, a timeless question since it invites me to think about my life from no particular point in it. And that seems to me to be an, I, I left it there because it seems to me to be an enormously um, profound way of putting the matter. It's not a question um, at a particular time. If you're in a moral dilemma, you know, the usual utilitarian problem, if you, if you step to the left, you kill one person. If you step to the right, you kill five people. What should you do? It's not a question about what you should do at any given moment. It's a question about how you should live your life. What is the right kind of life to live or what counts as a good kind of life to live? So it's not a question about a moral dilemma. It's a question about being a good human being. And it suggests also, and this is what's built into the, the use of the word timeless by Bernard Williams, it's a timeless question since it invites me to think about my life from no particular point in it. It suggests, and Plato suggests, that we can ask, how should I live about my whole life? And that question can be asked of any person, as it were, at any time and answered by any person at any time. So the question is asked and answered by Plato, and the question is asked and answered by me here now. How should I live is the question which Plato asks. I'm asking it. In fairness, in the treatise, Hume asks it. And the answer is going to be an answer that resonates down the years, even if it's not exactly the same. So the quest, Plato's question, it has this timeless and eternal quality and it suggests that there is such a thing as the good life for, for human beings. That claim, I'm losing, bear with me because I just lost my cursor. Um, that claim that there are these eternal questions that permit of eternal answers is hugely, hugely controversial. And the philosopher John Rawls um, says, the history of political, he's, put, he's talking specifically about political philosophy. The history of political philosophy is not the history of a series of answers to the same question, 
but of a series of answers to different questions. And even more starkly, Quentin Skinner, um, the founder, I suppose, of the so-called Cambridge School. Quentin Skinner says, what counts as an answer to a philosophical question will usually look in a different culture or period, so different in itself that it can hardly be in the least useful even to go on thinking of the relevant questions as being the same in the required sense. More crudely, we must learn to do our thinking for ourselves. So this line of thinking, which is very closely associated with, with uh, Cambridge uh, historians of political thought, particularly with Quentin Skinner, also with John Donne, th this line of thought says, look, the questions that are asked in history of political thought are asked from a vantage point so dramatically different from, from our, from in worlds, so dramatically different from ours, that it's just, there, there it said, it's not in the least useful to go on thinking of these questions as being the same. In the <coughs> so when Plato asks the question, how should one live? That is a very different question, suggests Skinner, from the question I ask when I ask, how should one live? And when Plato answers the question, how should one live, that's a very different answer from the answer that, that we give here and now. Go back to Rawls, the history of political philosophy is not a series of answers to the same question, but a series of answers to different questions. Now, if all of that is true, if all of that's true, then there's not a lot of philosophical point in reading thinking about Plato or about Locke or about Hume or about Kant or about any of these people because they're asking questions which are different from our questions here and now and they're giving answers that are very different from our, our answers here and now. Then there could be all sorts of other reasons for reading the ancients but it won't be because they can cast light on, on us on what we do and what we think. So against all of that, what I want to suggest is that this Cambridge School, that Skinner, John Donne, um, I think Rawls said that in a, an incautious moment, but I want to suggest that that's false and that actually there is a sense in which the questions which the ancient are, ancients ask are our questions and the answers which they give maybe our answers. And obviously I don't think that that's true across the piece without any sort of, um, without any caveat. But I think it's, I think that Plato's question, how should one live, is a question which we can understand, which is significant for us. And I think that the answer which the ancient tragedians give is an answer that's significant for us too. So what I want to do now is give two examples of ancient tragedy in which I think the ancients are asking a question that's important for us and are giving an answer that is important for us. And I begin with Antigone. Um, the story of Antigone as told by Sophocles and there are lots of versions of this story. So I, I'll, I'll just take this one. It's the story of a clash between the law of man and the moral law, the law of conscience. Um, in the story, Antigone, Antigone's brother, Polynices, is killed fleeing from battle. He dies, as it were, a traitor's death. And because he dies a traitor's death, Creon the king issues a commandment, an order, an edict, that he is not to be buried. He will not have the honor of burial, he, was, he will just lie where he fell. In ancient Greece, it is a terrible, terrible, wicked punishment to be unburied. And Antigone, there, there she is, here she is. Antigone, as his, his sister, uh, cannot cope with the idea that her brother should remain unburied. And she wrestles throughout the play. She wrestles with her conscience and her conscience fights against the law which the king has 
sat down and eventually she decides that she must bury her brother. And in deciding to bury him, she utters these words, which I've written on the slide, for these things live not today or yesterday, but for all time. And what she means by that is that the moral law, the law within her lives forever. That is an eternal law, which has power and authority over her in a way in which the laws of man, the laws of politics do not. So she's saying to Creon, your, your laws, be, you are as it were a come day, go day ruler. The laws that you have put down, the judgments that you have made will, will, will pass with the passing of time. But the eternal laws, the laws of, and now it depends how you tell it, you know, it can be the laws of God, it can be the laws of conscience, it can be the things exemplified, and I think we do it this way now, by doctrines of human rights. Those are things which are forever, which transcend the laws of individual governments or states. And it's because she, because she believes that those laws live not today, some laws, moral laws, live not today or yesterday, but for all time, that she buries Polynices. And of course she pays the price. Um, Polynices, uh, in, in burying Poly Polynices, she secures her own death. She's walled up and, and dies. And what I want to suggest here is that there is an eternal question to which Antigone provides an answer. So we can understand her plight it's not, a, it's not as, as Skinner and others suggest, it's not a question that's entirely alien to us. It's a question that occurs and recurs throughout history. Every time somebody finds that the law of their country or of their city or of their state conflicts with their own moral conscience. And now I just invite you to think of your own example. Um, Martin Luther King um, in the civil rights movement, where the laws of apartheid uh, of, of America under segregation are quite contrary to his own conviction about racial equality and, and justice. Think about um, civil disobedience generally, wherever there is civil disobedience in Hong Kong, in John Bunyan's England, um, in South Africa under apartheid, anywhere you like, in Green and Common, um, in all of these contexts, what's being said is there are laws of man, political laws, and once you have those laws, they can potentially conflict with one's own moral conviction, one's own conscience, and when they do, there is a question about how to respond. And that question, what is Antigone asking? She's asking, how should I live? And her answer is, I should live in accordance with my own conscience and not in accordance with the laws um, of put down by, by Crayon, by, by the political leader. I'm not saying that that's the right answer. I, I do think it is in her case, but isn't, the point is not that she gives the right answer. The point is that the question she addresses is a question which Sophocles puts before us. And it's a question which resonates down, down the ages. We know what it is to be faced with a question about whether you should obey the government, whether you should obey the law of the land, or whether you should obey your own conscience. And that's why, that's one reason why the ancient tragedies, Antigone and others, speak to us now across the centuries. And my next example, last example, is the example of Oedipus. Here's Oedipus um, answering the riddle of the Sphinx. And in the story of Oedipus, um, Oedipus, Oedipus' parents are told when he is a child that he will grow up to, to murder his father and marry his mother. And so they send him off fearful that he will indeed, that this child will indeed um, murder his father and marry his and marry his mother they take him up onto the mountainside and leave him to die but of course he doesn't die he is he's looked after by um, a shepherd family and in the fullness of time he grows up and makes his way to Thebes and on his way to Thebes to defend the city 
he meets uh, an elderly man and there is a quarrel and he kills the elderly man. And of course, you guessed it, guessed it, the elderly man his, is his father. So he has indeed killed his father and he, he doesn't realize it at that time. He's, he has killed his father. He goes on and marries Jocasta, who is his mother. And so as the play winds up and winds up and winds up, what becomes clear is that um, the, the prophecy that was, that was given at the beginning has become true. Oedipus has indeed done these terrible things. He has murdered his father, killed his father and married his mother. And now there's a question which again Bernard Williams asks very eloquently and answers even more eloquently. This is a story about a primitive society. It's a story about, uh, about um, which I say, it's a, it's a story about blood guilt. It's a story about superstition. It's a story about gods who are irrational. How can this be anything to do with us? And here comes the answer from, from Bernard Williams. This, by the way, is um, Oedipus, Oedipus killing his father. This is um, a depiction of, of him killing Laius. And here's Bernard William. Williams, the whole of the Oedipus Tyrannus, that dreadful machine, moves to the discovery of just one thing, that he did it, that is Oedipus, he did it. Do we understand the terror of that discovery only because we residually share magical beliefs in blood guilt or archaic notions of responsibility? Certainly not. We understand it because we know that in the story of one's life, there is an authority exercised by what one has done and not merely by what one has intentionally done. And what Williams is claiming here and what I want to suggest um, my, myself also here now is that in these ancient Greek tragedies, particularly in, in, in Oedipus, what's being put before us is the significance, not, not only of what we have, have intentionally done, but what we've done. What's being put before us is our own nature as vulnerable and needy creatures, really constantly um, driven by the vagaries of the world. So that, so that we are the, the victims of time and chance. And as I, I give away the story in a sense, you, it's there in the Bible also. We are that we are a certain kind of being. We are the victims of time and chance. We're vulnerable, we're needy. What we are, what we amount to morally is not simply a matter of what we choose or what we decide. And so it seems to me that this is again, a case in which the ancients speak to us and tell us not only about ourselves, but about, uh, about themselves, but about us about how we are as human beings transcending time and place, that we can do whatever we like about um, technologically, scientifically, but we cannot overcome our own nature as vulnerable and needy beings. And we cannot ov overcome the restraints and constraints that that will put on the answer to the question, how, one, how should one live? The way in which we should live can only be a way that's appropriate for somebody who, who is a victim of time and chance. So philosophy then, go back to the beginning. The question is what, is, what is the content? What counts as philosophy? What do philosophers do? Well, some thought what philosophers do is to talk about language and the way more, particularly moral language works. I don't myself think that. Some people think that philosophy tells us about what we ought to do. It may do that. Some say, well, it tells us what we should do here and now. And the history of it is um, in that sense, irrelevant or misleading. What I'm wanting to press is that if the question's asked, what does philosophy do? Or what's the content of philosophy? A large part of it is, Philosophy tries to answer the question, how should we live? How should I live? How should one live? How should we all live as human beings? And the answer to that question, while it will of course be nuanced by 
the fact that one lives in 21st century Northern England and not in Athens in the fourth century BC. Nonetheless, the answer that's given to Oedipus, the answer that's given to Antigone by the great tra tragedians is an answer that speaks to us insofar as it tells us about the human condition, about their condition and about our condition. So I started with Plato and the question, how should one live? And I end with the man who didn't ask the question so much as answer it, and that's Sophocles in those great tragic plays. Um, so that's not bad timing. Thank you very much. I hope you're still out there. Thank you very much for your, attendant, for, for your attention. And I stop the share now. Fantastic. It's 8.10 exactly, oh, Sue. Yeah. So amongst your many accomplishments. No, it was nothing. <laughs> that's uh, not, not the most impressive, but we're very grateful. And um, it was a, yeah extremely punchy and, and focused uh, talk and made the points very, very clearly. I think we should officially give you a moment to... Uh, gather your composure and your wine. Yes. <laughs> yes. I go do that. I, I mute so you don't hear the glug game. <laughs> don't worry about that at all. And um, while we do that, just to remind you, in case you didn't see from the email, um, Sue is a professor of political philosophy at the University of York, uh, published widely on modern and historical political philosophy with a special emphasis on the concept of toleration. Um, so that might add some ideas for questions. And Sue has also spoken to the club previously about um, subjects including the private lives of public figures, another very topical <laughs> issue um, at the moment. Um, so if you have a question, please unmute um, and either raise your hand uh, which you'll find hopefully at the bottom of the screen under reactions. You click on that and then there's a raise hand option. Uh, or if that's challenging, just uh, type a, a question into the, the chat uh, where you can see uh, a comment from Ian at the moment. You don't. You don't. Oh. Um, I think no, we have a question from Terry. So while others... Yeah. Other thoughts? Let's go straight to you, Terry. You'll need to unmute and then you can ask out loud. Uh, hello. Will you, will you ask a question? Can you hear me all right? We can. Yes. Oh, good. Well, thank, thank you, uh, uh, Susan. Um, it was, I thought it was a very interesting um, uh, talk that you gave. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm currently reading your book, by the way, <laughs> on toleration. All right. Um, um, your, the thing that you finished on seemed to be somewhat um, negative in the sense that you seem to be suggesting that um, we are we bear the sort of the, the lowly stamps of our inherited evolutionary past, and that there's no uh, morality really was uh, is a bit of a luxury um, as far as what we can decide to do. Is, is that is that is that your thinking? Um. I don't, I don't feel that morality is, is a, a luxury. I, I suppose what I feel, what, what I'm suggesting is that um, it's, not, it's not possible entirely to control one's own moral status. And that, the, let, well, let me put it a different way. Let me put it a different way. I, I think in, in the area of morality and also in the area of political philosophy, especially, I, I think there's huge damage done by the belief that um, we can we can somehow or other overcome the operation of luck. And it's the political systems will can be set up to be to be just. And then if people don't succeed, that's because they're, they're as it were, the unders, they're undeserving in some way. And that seems to me to be a huge error. And I suppose to put it more positively, what I find that really very profound in the writings of the Greek 
tragedians. Oh, you see. Thought that so much yeah. of life is, is a matter of, of luck. Um, politics exists to curb the worst excesses, but it can't expunge luck. And that what we are and what we become is, is, in, is we are vulnerable. And, and that what we are and what we become in, in the, you know, when you go to your grave, whether you've led a good life, been a good person, will depend in some part yes. on, on the luck that you had. And I suppose it's, it's I, don't know if that's, I don't think it's negative to think that. I think, on the contrary, I think it's very important for political philosophers to keep hold of that, because what political philosophy is trying to do, I think all the time, in drawing up um, schema for a just society is to just curb the worst excesses of that luck, whilst at the same time recognizing that luck is always going to be there. Is, is that making sense? Just disappeared. Oh, sorry, Terry, I think you're back on mute, but do respond if you can unmute yourself. No, that's fine. Thank you very much, that's helpful. Great, thank you, Terry. Um, I can see a question first from Nicholas. So if you unmute, and then I can see. Yes, I'm sorry, I can't. The hand up as well. I can't get the camera working, but um, no, actually, Sue Mendes, that was such a, so interesting. I, I'm. You must have read the Nietzsche book, The Birth of Tragedy. Oh, a long time ago. Yes. <laughs> Well, that, that, that is very, very interesting to me because basically um, he sees a schism between um, the Apollo outlook and the Dionysian outlook. And um, he equates, obviously, it, it's all about philosophy and tragedy. And he equates uh, um, Euripides with Socrates. Um, and he says, I haven't got it in front of me, um, uh, but something like goodness and virtue does not equal happiness, which he thinks that Socrates is, is, is a sort of uh, a fraud by doing this. And he salutes um, Aeschylus, who, because he thinks that Euripides is, you know, dealing in dialectical discussion and um, Euripides uh, and Aeschylus looks at the whole picture. And he, he's, um, I don't know, but, but Nietzsche sees Socrates as, as, well, he tries to distinguish Socrates as uh, Plato. And of course, we've got the problem of the dialectical questioning and the theory of forms that um, probably would lose most people. And I just struck me that when you were talking about um, John Stuart Mill and Kant, um, that, that um, actually um, Socrates was more like Kant and John Stuart Mill was more like the Dionysian aspect, sort of Aristophanes, who did write sort of tragedies like the frogs, who looks at the whole section of society and the, um, the happiness of society rather than the individual. Thank you, Nicholas. A lot there, Sue. Do pick up whichever <laughs> aspect of it you would most like to focus on. Well, I, I, I suppose, look, let me, st there's, there's, there's a, a lot there, and I have to be honest, it's a many, many, many years since I, since I read Nietzsche. But I, I suppose, look, let me try and link that with the previous question. Um, it's, it's true that, that this view is, is in, you know, in some sense or other Nietzschean, or it has, that, it has that air to it, because it suggests that um, we, we can't overcome all, all difficulties and all all the vagaries of, of, of life. But I, I want to, res and, and Nietzsche is always said to be a pessimist, and I, I want to resist the, the pessimistic dimension, if that's there, and simply to say, to say that all, it seems to me all, all you need to take from Nietzsche, all I want to take from Nietzsche in this context, is the thought that we don't have control over our, our entire lives. That's that's the only thing I want to to draw from it. That there will always be elements of luck, and and of course, if you if you live, um, if, if unless you invoke God, 
then that that will persist because you have no guarantee. And that's the Nietzschean position that if God is dead, he's dead. Okay. Can oh, I? I think we're getting a bit of interference there. Please <laughs> do go back on mute if you're doing something else. Um, we we have uh, thank you for that, Sue. We have um, a question from someone using Linda Harris's computer. I suspect you're not Linda. I Harris. am indeed using Linda Harris. Well, it's actually <laughs> my computer. I'm John Harris. Um, thank you, John. My very brief answer to the question, "How should one live?" might be to refer to the so-called golden rule in one of its many formulations. Uh, how would you react to that? Well, what, is which, too formulation that? which one? Choose a formulation and we can do that then too. Um, do not do to others what you would not have them do to yourself. Um, Rabbi Hillel, I think. Okay. Well, let's take it. Well, sorry, there's, there's of course the Bernard Shaw answer isn't there um that don't do unto others as you'd have them do unto you because their tastes may be different but but that's a cheap shot so i won't i won't do it um the the golden rule of of treating others as you would that i i don't have have an objection per se to that what i was trying to do here this evening was to say the, the, the central question or a central question of moral philosophy isn't a question about what you should do but a question about how you should live. What kind of life is a good life for a human being? Now, if the, the thing like do unto others as you'd have them do unto you um, is, is really a question about action. And what I was trying to focus on here was not action in a particular situation. What should I do in the situation where, um, I don't know, somebody, I encounter somebody destitute, homeless on the street, what should I do? Well, I should do for them what I would have them do for me. I, I'm not really addressing that. I'm I'm addressing the wider question: how how should we live our lives? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So it's a bit of, sort of orthogonal. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. We have a question. Um, I'll come to Barbara uh, next. Do you want to say your question out loud, or shall I read it? Yeah, you'll read it. <laughs> I'll read it. Um, Barbara's question is, you know, in a, in a lifetime, you'd go through various ages, of course, child, adult, and then older person, and there would surely be a different focus um, at different stages of your life. And so to what, to what extent do you think the answer, of, the answer to the question how one should live changes during one's life? Yeah. No, it, that, that's that, that's a very a very fair point. I I suppose. Look, do it in a different way. What, when I when I first taught, as it were, this this angle on things at, at the university, I I made use of something in um, in Hume's. It's it's in Rawls' Theory of Justice, also in Hume's treatise, where Hume says. You need to think about that. You need to think about whether your life bears reflection, and it's a sort of deathbed thought in a way. So as I go through life, I'm, I must ask myself: If I do this now, think of Antigone again. So I bury my brother now. Will my life bear reflection at the end when I lie there on my deathbed? Will I think? that has been a life that was well lived or, or not. And it's really looking at it from that angle. I, I concede absolutely that what would count as a good life, what you might think of as a good life when you're 17 is different from what you might think of as a good life when you're 35. I and mean, I can see all of that, but I think there is underlying that, or maybe on top of that, I don't know. There is a question, is this a life well lived? And you can surely say that of, of, of some people. I mean, whether it's appropriate they should say it of themselves is another matter. But you can surely look at some people and, and say that was a life that was well lived. And mm. people like Mandela, you know, where you, where you want to say, well, there were, there were certain choices that were made and things went badly wrong at certain stages, but all in all, it was a life well, well lived. 
and it, and it's that it's that kind of question that 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 Plato wants us to ask: How should one live? How should we chart our way through? So, okay, let's answer your question this way then. I think what Plato is saying is: How should we chart our way through life? And of course, there'll be a different answer to that when you're fourteen or twenty-four or forty-four. But it's still a question about the life, about about an in a whole life, the course of a life, or the the journey of life. Um, can I speak? At yes. This oh, yes, go for Barbara. Yeah. It, but yeah, uh, it's just that um, I was as a as a very young child who had to read because I was ill so long and so much, um, and there was nothing else to do. I came across the Greek legends and came across, of course, Paris with the golden apple. Oh, and yeah. when I read it, I thought, God, what an idiot man. <laughs> he shouldn't have done this of giving Aphrodite the golden apple. He should have given it to Athene because you have to, first of all, learn and, and understand what's around you and have education and and be intelligent in order to be able to solve all life's problems. And then I thought, ah, but I came across Odysseus, who is of course very cunning. What would he have done instead of Paris with regard to the um, goddesses, the three goddesses? He would have got them to negotiate with each other so that they would each take a third of a lifetime. So Athene would be the first one for the first third of your living, uh, all to do with, with learning and things. The second part would be your um, Aphrodite because you're in the prime of your life and you go around and do various things. And the third part would be of course, your family, because you are old and you would be um, looked after. And then I thought this was a good solution. But then I became old myself. <laughs> so I thought, no, this is not right. And the reason why I thought that is because I used to teach children with sensory impediment and as a result, I thought, well, what would you have uh, problems with in your lifetime that you have to, to some degree, solve um, in order to stay alive and be part of living? And the first one, of course, was the um, idea of education. But then I thought the second should be your family because you're launching off the next generation and trying to make sure that there is some stability and whatever there is, um, something good that you can contribute. And the final one is that you have to look after your own senses um, and you have to be very practical in that way. For example, you know, I'm fortunate enough that I can have actually um, um, laser surgery to make sure that I can see properly and all these things help me and, and these are practical solutions and because of that I can then still stay in uh, living to some degree making a contribution maybe or enjoying life maybe and therefore for me that is a life worth living in that way. Barbara, what do you thank, think? thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> I do want to give everyone a chance to yeah. uh, consider that. Sue, did you have an immediate uh, reply? We've got a couple more questions waiting. I want, as I've well. got some questions on the chat here also, and I wonder if I can take that question in conjunction with a question that's just come up on 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 the chat, which, which is, um, isn't it how one should lead one? Isn't that the way one should lead one's life a series of individual incidents? Of moral dilemma when a Kantian or utilitarian answer would be useful and I, I think the short answer to that is yes I mean a particular moral dilemma then of course you're asking yourself should I the the, the utilitarian or the Kantian question so I'm not wanting to, to 
in any sense to reject that question or the question that that you just asked now about you know as a young person you you have a certain um set of problems and as a middle-aged person you have another set of problems i i don't want to to deny that those are the case but i want to i suppose you know i want to to, to turn to turn people around and say but there's also a question which is forgotten quite often and that is the question am i am i when, when i've when i've as it were responded to the dilemma i can feel can't i i behaved in a way that was unworthy i mean there's that thought as it's not a, which isn't a question about um it isn't a question about of a counting kind or a utilitarian kind. It is the question, what sort of person do you want to be? And I, I think we must all sometimes have been in a situation where um, you, you, you do a particular thing in a certain moral, in, in, if you're in a moral dilemma or you have a moral problem. And what matters at the end of it is not that you behave this way rather than that. What matters is that you, is that you showed yourself to be a kind of person that you perhaps didn't want to be. You know, I, was, I mean, surely we've all thought sometimes, but when I did that, that was a small thing to do. That was a petty thing. That was a childish. I don't want to be that kind of person. And it's that I think that Plato is drawing to our attention is the way in which your character is, is built up mm -hmm. by these series of individual incidents. So it's, it's true that, that there are individual incidents, moral dilemmas, but there's also the question, do you like what you see in the mirror when you've answered all those individual questions? And that's what Plato's saying. When, you, when you've done all of this, can you live with the person that you've constructed, as it were, through the answers to those questions? Thank you, Sue. We do, we do have a couple of people who've been waiting patiently Patiently-ish. <laughs> um, waiting, question. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> waiting. Um, yeah. Let's go to Ian first. Hi. Hello. Hello. You can hear me. Yes. Um, I've got two short questions. The first one might be a little bit unfair, in which case I'll apologise beforehand. But if I was asked, or if a non-philosopher was asked, um, how should one live? How should I live? The sort of answers you'd get would be, take exercise. Um, Look after your diet, um, socialize, uh, make a difference. You know, th these are the sort of important things um, that you know, how one should live. This is the sort of advice you get from a non philosopher, I think. Uh, so the question is how, how, how do you feel about that? Do you think that's more valuable than the philosopher's answer? And then moving on to my second question, just to give you time to think about that. <laughs> Um, is to do with conscience. And what you just said was, don't be unworthy. And I noted that. Don't, you know, follow your conscience. Don't be unworthy. Uh, be able to live with yourself. And I'd suggest that's very close to uh, Aya, uh, in that it's boo and hooray, because what you're doing is following how you feel, actually. If you're following your conscience, you're following how you feel. And it, isn't it the same as Aya, really? At the end of it, Antigone. Okay, two. Th I, at I mean, the end of my um, question. Sorry. Right. Well, well the, I, I've got two answers. Um, no, and and no. Um, <laughs> so, I I don't think where where there's where it's what how should one live? Well, take exercise and you know eat healthily and so on. Um, that's that's not the question that. Um, that's a, that's a question that looks at my at myself, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not a question about of, of a sort of ethical kind. What is what is the way you should live in society or along with other people? I mean, so I show my own colours now. I I do I do find it sort of depressing, the extent to which people become really quite obsessed by healthy eating and diet and exercise. Um, it's the sort of the culture of the body. If you go into the gym, and, I, I, and I'm delighted to tell you, I, I wear it as a badge of honor, I don't go in there very much. But we do go in there and people are there and they're doing exercises with a, against a long wall of mirrors. And I just think, well, 
if the question is how should one live, the answer is not like that, really. And that's, I, I just, I don't have an argument for this. I simply say, I don't think that that, I don't think that is a, a, a good way to, to live. So, so, so you know, that's that. Conscience, the question about conscience is, is really, really crucial. And, and actually, I, I, I think you do hit, a, I, I don't agree with you that conscience is just a matter of how you feel. There'll be all sorts of other things involved there too. Uh, but I, I do share this, insofar as you're expressing this concern, I share it. And the concern is that conscience can tell us bad things as well as good. Yeah. Um, and you see, if you want, you know, the literary place for that, which is spectacular, I think, is in the opening chapters of Huckleberry Finn, where, where Huck Finn, um, take, or actually the whole book, where he takes, where he takes Jim, the black slave, down the river and when he's to take him to freedom. And as he's taking him to freedom, he, Huck Finn, is overcome by conscience. And he, he cause he knows mm. that he's taking Miss Watson's property. And what has Miss Watson ever done to him that he, Jim, should, should behave, he, Huck, I'm sorry, should behave this badly. And the way, the way it's described by Mark, Mark Twain all along is you know, Huck saying to himself, conscience really, really, gets the better of me now, now I really know that I've, that, 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 that I've done wrong. And the wrong thing he's done is to take Jim the slave to freedom. So conscience, is, it's, it's, it's really, really very, I think it's a hugely intriguing moral story. But the point of it at this, at this juncture is conscience can tell us wrong things as well as right ones. So I don't think conscience is just a matter of boo hurrah. Uh, and and certainly, you know, Ayer would not agree with Antigone that, that the moral law lives not today or yesterday, but for all time. That's so, so there's a big, dif huge difference between them there. But if you say, well, what, how, how do I justify acting in accordance with conscience other than that this is the way it seems to me? I think that's a very hard question to which I don't have, you know, this is where this is where you 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 want to say well if only we had more time I could answer this question, but if we had more time I couldn't answer this question. It, it's it's a, I think it's really it's difficult. a hard question. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Sue. There's a great couple of answers. Uh, we have one in the chat, but Paul has been waiting okay. uh, for a while. So Paul, do you, we're getting a bit short on time. So if you can ask your question fairly briefly. Okay, I'll be fairly. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Yes. Marvelous. Um, I was going to divulge a little bit into language, but simply restricted on time. I just thought I'd like to ask a question regarding Henry Sidgwick, who to say about the golden rule earlier on, he actually he actually questioned that by saying the formula is obviously imprecise in statement, or one might wish for another's corporation in sin and be willing to reciprocate it. So that's going to be a problem. I didn't hear that. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Could you repeat it for me? Yeah. Well, Henry Sidwick said with the Golden Rule that one might wish for another's cooperation in sin and be willing to reciprocate it. So that could be a problem regarding the Golden Rule. Yes. My question with Sidwick is that he said a lot about utilitarianism and about John Stuart Mill. And he also asked about, and he said the term being good was a rather ambiguous term to use. Um, so I wondered how you thought about that. And also very quickly, very, very quickly, Miranda Fricker wrote about language as well. And she said about the, uh, about the credibility deficit, and credibility ex excess while language, while we are talking to each other. And I wondered if you had any thoughts on any of those two subjects. Pick one, any one will do. Yeah, I'm, 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 so I'm really struggling to hear you. Right. Um, so I, I'm, I mean, I suppose as far as the, the question that Citric is concerned, it seems to me to be the, the question of cooperation in sin. That seems to me to be a, an, an interesting thought. I, I, it, it's, I don't touch on it here, but it's, it, it's, I, I certainly concede that that is that's a feature of a situation but I, i'm so i must apologize because i the, the second part I, I i've struggled to hear what what you're saying so i i, I fear i won't answer yeah, I, I don't didn't, know what I didn't get it all myself answering. so well, maybe we can follow up with paul afterwards and, and get <laughs> get it in in writing um but we're we're pretty much at time there is one question in the chat which also touches on something 
um, I wanted to ask, and then we'll we'll finish. Um, Simon says, uh, you know, if luck is so important, why plan? Yeah. And I think it it relates to some remarks you made earlier around um, you know the the fact of what you're responsible for and what your actions in fact turn out to be is morally significant, uh, which is an important part of Bernard Williams work yeah. of course on on yeah. moral luck yeah. and that seems to uh, be a very opposite approach to that of the Stoics for example who say who, if I can generalize who said that you know regardless of the situation what matters is your moral response to it so all in all looking at the ancients is, is moral luck a crucial element or is it more about character? I do think moral luck is is a, a a crucial element and I think I want to, to, to I, I think I want to resist the thought that if there's luck then then it's pointless to plan because your I think what I want to say is your your plan is premised on the understanding that things may not go the way you planned I mean the, the classic case here is, is Chamberlain you know he comes back with the piece of paper peace in our time and he's, let's suppose, he's done absolutely everything in his power. And back he comes. And it's taken out of his hands. It doesn't work out the way he thought. Now, it doesn't mean that he shouldn't have planned. It doesn't mean that he shouldn't have gone, that he shouldn't have tried. It's just to say that what he did outran what, what he intended and what he planned for. I don't think it makes planning... I, I, I don't see why one would think that that makes planning redundant or, or, or otios. It's because it's just the possibility of luck, not, not the certainty of luck intervening, but just the possibility. But, but also, I suppose there's this certainty that if luck does inter intervene, it's your luck and you have to live with it as your luck. Can I just, since I asked that question, maybe just intervene quickly, that isn't it also luck that you are who you are? Yes, that you are. absolutely. Yes. And, and that's that's absolutely it is. And, and that, I think, is built into Rawls' theory of justice in a way that's not recognised when Rawls says, well, how do we construct political institutions? Well, and I, this was this used to really intrigue me when I when I taught the, the students, I would always say, well, you know, so much of life, if you're organising political institutions, so much of life is 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 just luck. And it's, it's luck whether you're born into a rich family or a poor family. And it's luck whether you're born into the first world or the third world. And they would agree, I'd go all along with that. And then I would say, and it's in rules, then I would say, and it's, it's luck whether you're clever or not. Well, yes, that's fine. And it's, and it's luck whether you are able to work hard. Some would say, but no, no, but I worked hard. So, well, it's, it's luck whether you're somebody who... who can work hard or not. Some people are just born lazy and they can't, you know, that's the way they are. Ah, oh, no, they didn't, they didn't like that one at all. They, they didn't like that at all. And at that point, they, every one of them became, as it were, a meritocrat. That it, they're happy with the idea that if, if you're, so, so, so there was one woman, young woman student, she was a remarkable student, and she was born into very, very a broken home in desperate, desperate situation. And she she got the A-levels and she got a good degree. And she said, well, I'm not accepting what you're telling me, that this, I, I worked for this and I deserve it. And I think it's really, you know, that's that's a tough nut to crack. But I, I the, the point, when you say, well, look, it's it's luck where one's born and the circumstances of one's life, this this is for sure how far down you can drill and keep saying, well, that's luck too. It's luck that you're clever. It's luck that you can try hard. It's, it's luck, luck of DNA as well. That I don't know. Luck that you exist. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you go far enough back. <laughs> yeah, if you go far enough back. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Sue. I want to respect your time as well as everyone else's. So I'll, I'll draw things to a, to a close there. Um, I'll briefly introduce the next talk in a second, um, but can we all just say a huge thank you to Sue for giving her time and her thoughts to us tonight? The traditional muted clap. <laughs> you get the idea, Sue. <laughs>
Uh, thanks so much. And um, our next talk, uh, if you'd like to register, you can do that through the website. I will also send out emails. Is yet another topical question, uh, the notion of truth in the biomedical sciences. And that's with Andreas Bickfalvi. And thank you so much to Barbara Sivos for the introduction to Andreas. Um, and he's going to talk about different notions of truth uh, evidence in medicine and what kind of theory of truth is required for biomedical science to work. Um, so hopefully there will be some uh, interesting and uh, relevant points for us there. Uh, thank you so much to everyone for coming along. Yes. Uh, I really thank enjoyed the discussion. Sue. I hope you did well, thank too. You. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's been a real pleasure. And um, when you're able to meet out, you know, in the pub, Yes. Don't forget your old friends. <laughs> I'm, I'm buying my own drink tonight, but oh, I like it. I like it better when you do. <laughs> thank, oh, you. And it was well thank you very much. Thank and, you. And, and, and Sue, I have sent you a message. I don't know if you. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, once we go, we go. Is you can email me. That might be the easiest. How do I do that? Nick, I think Nick will give you my email. Yes, that, just um, send an email to barnesphilosophy at gmail.com and I can put anyone yeah. in touch. So that's One, the, the email that the newsletters come from. Okay. Because this will just disappear. There's a lot of chat here and that will disappear once the... You, you just get thrown out, don't you, of the Zoom meeting. Yep. Um, so, but right. email me. Thank so you. Do, do email and I can pass, pass any messages on to Sue. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Sue. Talk again next month, I hope.